In January 2016, the presidential elections in Haiti had to be postponed because of widespread violence. It was widely reported in the mainstream with coverage from Reuters to the New York Times, all showing scenes of roadblocks and burning in the streets. The Washington Post ran a piece detailing how, after cancelling its presidential elections, Haiti heads towards chaos. What was left out of nearly all the articles was the overwhelming role of the US and the bodies it directs, such as the World Bank and Inter-American Development Bank, in guiding Haitian society towards oblivion. In the aftermath of the 2010 earthquake, the mass privatization of state-run assets and the turning of Haiti into a Caribbean sweatshop that the US had been pushing from the mid-1990s through the 2000s became a distinct possibility. This Huffington Post article Business as government capitalizing on disaster in post-earthquake Haiti shows how, since the earthquake, US firms have actually been involved in privatizing governance, in fact, the governance of another country. After the election of President Michel Martelly in May 2011, things remained easy for this private sector-led consensus. The international financial institutions and US not only had their shock event, but also their shock president. In Martelly, the US government had found its Chicago boy, a more than willing partner for their economic program. In this Al Jazeera investigation, revealed US aid funded groups supporting Haitian president in 2011, the true extent of US support for Martelli was shown. The US Agency for International Development gave nearly $100,000 to a Haitian political movement with close ties to President Michel Martelli after the country's 2010 elections. In 1990, after the first democratic elections in Haiti's 200-year history, the US became hopeful of breaking up the corrupt state institutions. Private capital would then be able to penetrate deeper into the country and an economic model conducive to the interests of the rich countries could take firm root. But it wasn't going to plan. Instead of the US-orientated reformer many in Washington had hoped for, a huge mass movement named Lavalas, or Flood in English, propelled the social democratic priest Jean-Bertrand Aristide to a landslide victory. As the London Review of Books reported here in 2004, Aristide's elevation from slum priest to presidential candidate took place against the background of right-wing death squads and threatened military coups. But on 16th of December 1990, he got 67% of the vote in a field of 12 candidates, a landslide victory. Aristide, who was president at various points in the 1990s and early 2000s, continues to be the most popular politician in Haiti, but is banned from standing again for the presidency. Aristide had become a nuisance in the eyes of Washington, and so when he was put back in power again in 2001, it was under the tacit agreement that he would allow the World Bank, the IMF, and the US to institute their plan. It had been 11 years since the democratic elections, and still economic reform was slow. Something had to change. Democracy was fine, but it had to be of use. This Guardian article correctly points out that Aristide now has many enemies among the Haitian middle class, intelligentsia and political class to say nothing of the dominant business class and the Troika. René Preval, a former ally of Aristide who served as president from 2006 to 2011, seemed to offer some hope for the Americans. In the context of the developing world, we would most accurately describe him as a neoliberal, particularly in that he has embraced free markets and foreign investment notes one of the US Embassy's diplomatic cables released by WikiLeaks and sent from Port-au-Prince in 2007. But the leader the US was really after in the period looked more like Haitian-American businessman Dumas Simeus. A resident of Texas, he assured the US Embassy, according to a US cable sent in 2005, again leaked by WikiLeaks, that he would manage Haiti like a business. The same cable added, the 65-year-old said he had decided to run for president not only for Haiti's benefit, but also as a gesture of thanks to the United States. But as the US was honing its strategy for its latest push, on 12th of January 2010, a huge earthquake hit Port-au-Prince and surrounding areas. Everyone around the globe was aware of the tragedy, as the global press covered pictures of scenes of devastation. More than 300,000 people were killed, while millions became homeless. The capital city lay in ruins, including the majority of the government ministries as well as the presidential palace. What was left of an already strangled civil society and social institutions was destroyed. Haiti was a blank slate. This report in the International Business Times said that 70% of buildings were destroyed in the event. The US and its allies in the IMF and World Bank did not waste any time in realising that this was the opportunity to push through their radical neoliberal programme from the 1990s with little resistance. The opposition to this privatisation programme, which had ranged from quasi-nationalist politicians to worker-based collectives, had all but disappeared. 
Without a government in place to agree or disagree with the US and the international financial institutions, which were soon running the country, Haiti was ready for radical economic prescriptions. The New Statesman reported that Haiti had become a target for economic shock therapy. It referenced Naomi Klein's book, The Shock Doctrine, which warns of the rise of disaster capitalism, under which governments and corporations use disasters as a chance to push through free market policies unachievable in times of stability. The New Statesman piece continued that following the devastation inflicted on Haiti by Tuesday's earthquake, it's clear that the country has become a target for such economic shock therapy. Klein's argument was that these policies were so unpopular amongst the population of the target countries that agents of big capital, like the IMF and World Bank, would wait until there was a crisis, real or perceived, when people could not organise resistance to push through the reforms. This article in the New Statesman was one of many at the time that called for a sustained fight back against this process being inflicted on Haiti. The writer quotes a report from the Heritage Foundation, a conservative think tank, amidst the suffering crisis in Haiti offers opportunities to the US, which declared, in addition to providing immediate humanitarian assistance, the US response to the tragic earthquake in Haiti offers opportunities to reshape Haiti's long dysfunctional government and economy, as well as to improve the public image of the United States in the region. The first step was to entrench a decision-making system that took all power out of the hands of accountable democratic institutions run by Haitians. To those Haitian members, it was obvious they were window dressing. In the December 2010 letter of protest to the International Human Rights Commission chair, former US President Bill Clinton, they complained of being completely disconnected from the activities of the IHRC, as well as having time neither to read, nor analyse, nor understand, and much less respond intelligently to projects submitted, as shown here on the Real News website. This article in The Nation concluded, these 12 board members surmised that their only function is to rubber stamp, as Haitian approved, decisions already made by the executive committee. That was exactly the perception that the US and the international financial institutions were trying to avoid. Officials from the US and the international agencies in Haiti were at pains to explain how they were working for the Haitians and the phrase of the day was Haitian-led. It was the same all over the world. The US and its agencies were adept at making their domination be seen as demanded by the victim. In truth, there was and continued to be minimal Haitian involvement in the reconstruction outside of the business elite. This article in the Washington Post put it bluntly in January 2011. There is a dramatic power imbalance between the international community under US leadership and Haiti. The former monopolizes economic and political power and calls all the shots. The financial benefits to the American private sector of this setup were immediately obvious. An Associated Press investigation found that of every $100 of Haiti reconstruction contracts awarded by the American government, $98.40 returned to American companies. Open Democracy reports that the focus was never on building up indigenous capacity. Any work was to be outsourced to foreign companies or NGOs by the International Human Rights Committee. It was about making more money for rich Americans. After Michel Martelly was sworn in as president in May 2011, it took months for the former pop star and former member of the savage Tonton Makut militia, formed by the US-backed dictator Duvalier, to form a government, as his candidates for cabinet positions were repeatedly rejected by parliament. By the time his administration was in place in June 2011, 18 months after the earthquake, the coordinates of the economic reconstruction were already in place. Martelli's hands were tied by the very international financial institutions who claimed to be subordinate to the Haitians. Though in Martelli's case, his hands didn't even need to be tied. He was a willing shock president. There were three elements that the US and international financial institutions wanted to build the new Haiti around. High-end tourism, export processing zones, and a resurgent private sector in control of the previously state-owned assets. These economic parks are known in the international financial institutions literature as Integrated Economic Zones, or IEZs, places where infrastructure, welfare services and other services are provided for the lucky few behind imposing metal gates. This literature, justifying the existence, argues that prospective foreign investors put off by the decrepit or non-existent roads, electricity grid and water system throughout Haiti would here have access to a ready-made mini-city. Amid manifold reservations from both international investors and labor rights groups, the Inter-American Development Bank and the United States Agency for International Development finished the construction of the flagship project in the economic reconstruction of Haiti, the Caracol Industrial Park, 40 miles from the northern capital of Camp Haitian. Here you can see it celebrated by the Inter-American Development Bank, the Clinton Foundation and USAID. 
Perhaps the emblematic project of this new Haiti the US has built was brokered by the Inter-American Development Bank, an initiative with Coca-Cola who have created a new soda called Mango Tango, which will be supplied with mangoes from newly developed producers. A similar deal with Starbucks seeks to transform individual micro-farmers into cooperatives and then supply coffee to Starbucks and market it as Haitian coffee. Critical analysts call this the sweatshops and mangoes development model, as the FT reports. Haiti remains a majority agrarian country. It needs an agrarian-based development model that distributes land amongst its homeless people for community-based subsistence cultivation. The economic managers of the country are not interested. The long-held dream of a Caribbean sweatshop is being born instead. Out of one of history's worst humanitarian catastrophes, we have Mango Tango. The US's victory was Haiti's defeat and the violence of 2016 is the result of pressure built up from the extremist economic vision being imposed on Haiti and the discarding of the Haitian people's wishes.